I lunched on a veranda overlooking the common. The sea was not visible, but I could hear it on the other side of the belt of firs. And the veranda facing south and being hot and airless, a longing to get into the cool water took hold of me. The waiter said the bathing huts were open in the afternoon from four to five, and I went upstairs to tell Gertrude to bring my things down to the beach at four when she would find me lying in the sand. The fir wood was stuffy and suggested mosquitoes, but several bath guests had slung up hammocks and were lying in them dozing so that there could not have been mosquitoes. And coming suddenly out onto the sands, all idea of stuffiness vanished, for there was the same glorious, heaving, sparkling, splashing blue that I had seen from the dunes of Gehirin the evening before at sunset. The bathing house, a modest place with only two cells and a long plank bridge running into deep water, was just opposite the end of the path through the firs. It was locked up and deserted. The sands were deserted too, for the tourists were all dozing in hammocks or in beds. I made a hollow in the clean, dry sand beneath the last of the fir trees and settled down to enjoy myself till Gertrude came. Oh, I was happy. Thesa was so quiet and primitive, the afternoon so radiant, the colors of the sea and of the long line of silver sand and of the soft green gloom of the background of firs, so beautiful. I think I must have slept, for the sound of the waves grew very far away, and I only seemed to have been watching the sun on them for a few minutes when Gertrude's voice floated across space to my ears, and she was saying it was past four, and that one lady had already gone down to bathe, and that, as there were only two cells, if I did not go soon, I might not get a bathe at all. I sat up in my hollow and looked across to the huts. The bathing woman in the usual white calico sunbonnet was there, waiting on the plank bridge. No one was in the sea yet. It was a great bore that there should be anyone else bathing just then, for German female tourists are apt to be extraordinarily cordial in the water. On land, laced into suppressive whalebone, dressed, and with their hair dry and curled, they cannot but keep within the limits set by convention. But the more clothes they take off, the more do they seem to consider the last barrier between human creature and human creature broken down, and they will behave towards you, meeting you on this common ground of wateriness, as though they had known you and extravagantly esteemed you for years. Their cordiality, too, becomes more pronounced in proportion to the coldness and roughness of the water, and the water that day looked cold and was certainly rough, and I felt, there being only two of us in it, it would be impossible to escape the advances of the other one. Still, as the cells were shut at five, I could not wait till she had done, so I went down and began to undress. While I was doing it, I heard her leave her cell and anxiously ask the woman if the sea were very cold. Then she apparently put in one foot, for I heard her shriek. Then she apparently bent down, and scooping up water in her hand, splashed her face with it, for I heard her gasp. Then she tried the other foot and shrieked again. And then the bathing woman, fearful lest five o'clock should still find her on duty, began mellifluously to persuade. By this time I was ready, but I did not choose to meet the unknown emotional one on the plank bridge, because the garments in which one bathes in German waters are regrettably scanty. So I waited, peeping through the little window. After much talk, the eloquence of the bathing woman had its effect and the bather, with one wild scream, leapt into the foam, which immediately engulfed her, 
And when she emerged, the first thing she did on getting her breath was to clutch hold of the rope and shriek without stopping for at least a minute. It must be very cold, I thought to myself, not without a secret shrinking. But to my surprise, when I ran along the planks above where the unfortunate clutched and shrieked, she looked up at me with a wet but beaming countenance and interrupted her shrieks to gasp out, Prachtful! Really, these bath guests in the water, I thought indignantly. What right had this one, only because my apparel was scanty, to smile up at me and say, Prachtful! I was so much startled by the unexpected exclamation from a person who had the minute before been rending the air with her laments that my foot slipped on the wet planks. I just heard the bathing woman advising me to take care, just had time to comment to myself on the foolishness of such advice to one already hurling through space, and then came a shock of all engulfing coldness and wetness and suffocation. And the next moment, there I was, gasping and spluttering, exactly as the other bath guest had gasped and spluttered, but with this difference, that she had clutched the rope and shrieked. And I, with all the convulsive energy of panic, was shrieking and clutching the bath guest. Prachtful nicht, I heard her say with an odious jollity through the singing in my ears. Every wave lifted me a little off my feet. My mouth was full of water. My eyes were blinded with spray. I continued to cling to her with one hand, miserably conscious that after this there would be no shaking her off, and rubbing my eyes with the other, looked at her. My shrieks froze on my lips. Where had I seen her face before? Surely I knew it. She wore one of those gray India rubber caps drawn tightly down to her eyes that keep the water out so well and are so hopelessly hideous. She smiled back at me with the utmost friendliness and asked me again whether I did not think it glorious. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I panted, letting her go and groping blindly for the rope. Thank you, thank you, pray pardon me for having seized you so rudely. Bitter, bitter, she cried, beginning to jump up and down again. Who in the world is she? I asked myself, getting away as fast as I could. Where have I seen her before? Probably she was an undesirable acquaintance. Perhaps she was my dressmaker. I had not paid her last absurd bill, and that and a certain faint resemblance to what my dressmaker would look like in an India rubber cap was what put her into my head, and no sooner had I thought it than I was sure of it, and the conviction was one of quite unprecedented disagreeableness. How profoundly unpleasant to meet this person in the water, to have come all the way to Rügen, to have walked miles in the heat of the day to Thiesau for the sole purpose of bathing tete-a-tete -tete with my dressmaker, and to have tumbled in on top of her and clung about her neck. I climbed out and ran into my cell. My idea was to get dressed and away as speedily as possible, Yet with all Gertrude's haste, just as I came out of my cell, the other woman came out of hers in her clothes, and we met face to face. With one accord, we stopped dead, and our mouths fell open. What? she cried. It is you? What? I cried. It is you? It was my cousin Charlotte, whom I had not seen for ten years.